the Irish love stories, and we delight in telling them. Get an Irishman or an Irish woman, for that matter, put a pint of the black stuff in their hand, and you'll probably get a story about something or other. And that storytelling tradition goes back into the mists of time. In Ireland, long ago, there were many stories and superstitions regarding all sorts of things. Great heroes, holy men who did amazing things, various spirits, demonic creatures, fairies, the little people, the Banshee and the Kayak. Now this latter, the Kayak, is a fascinating being from Irish folklore. Stories about her abound, which we shall be looking at in a moment, though she's not consistent. Her personality, her purpose, even her appearance change from story to story, though some things are usually seen as general representations of her. She is old, for example, except, of course, when she isn't. She is dangerous and not to be trusted, except when she is kind and caring. In other words, she is actually far from the stereotype image one might at first have about her which will be obvious when we take a look at some of the fascinating stories associated with her, of which there are many. She is probably best known generally through an Irish poem by Podrick Pierce, entitled Ní Sheir, or I Am Ireland, written in 1912, in which he uses her to represent Ireland itself. And in a direct translation, part of it goes like this. Ní Sheir. I am Ireland, I am older than the old woman up there. Great my glory, I who bore Cuchull and the brave. Great my shame, my own children who sold their mother. I am Ireland, I am lonelier than the old woman. Now, in the Irish, she calls her Anchaliach Bear, which can be translated as the old woman of Bear, or as the hag, the witch, or the old woman seen as a witch, sometimes even as a veiled woman. The meaning is rather vague and does depend a bit on your point of view, though she's usually referred to as a hag or a witch in the popular culture. That's Loch Crewe, for example, in the county near. There are some mountains with magnificent Neolithic burial mounts on them dating back to well before 3000 BC, and the highest of these is named Shreve Nechaliach, and that is almost always translated in tourist information as the Mountain of the Witch. Nechaliach herself is closely associated with Loch Crewe in the old legends, as she is with the Bear Peninsula in County Cork, as the old woman of Bear, and in County Sligo, using her supposed name of Garavogue, with the Garavogue River so named in her honour. In such places, she was said to have gone jumping around on mountain tops, dropping pebbles from her apron, leaping so she was, mountain to mountain, bouncing along without a bother at all, and she an old woman. And there are various versions of how and why she was so athletically occupied, one version having her actually meet her death at Loch Croom, having made an almighty, humongous leap onto the highest mountain lost her footing and fallen to splat on the land below, which would indeed be rather bad for one's health. As a little side note, one of the burial mounts on Slivnachal, the, the biggest one in fact, is surrounded by a large retaining uh, stone circle. And one of these, called the Hag's Chair, is a massive chair-like stone that almost seems to have armrests nine feet across and some five foot ten inches in height, said, according to legend, to be the seat upon which the Haliak there would sit and survey her domain, presumably before her demise by falling off the mount. But women who sit on the stone are, yes, women who sit on the stone are said to feel a wonderful energy rising up through their bodies, uplifting. And if you make a wish while seated upon the stone, then walk three times around the burial mound, that wish will be granted. So if you're ever in the vicinity of Old Castle in the county Meath, get yourself up, see, sit on the hag seat, and if you're a woman, feel that wonderful energy flowing up through you. 
or to a billion eggs and so forth. Make a wish and go for a triple stroll around the burial mound and the luck of the Irish will descend upon you. Your wish will be granted and don't blame me if it isn't. Around 1720, Jonathan Swift, Dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin and the author, of course, of Gulliver's Travels, wrote a poem in which he refers to the Hurriac by name as Garavoke and to both her incredibly athletic mountain hopping and the chair on which she is said to have sat. And it goes like this. Twelve giant elks trained to the car had brought the warlike dame from far Bengal where reigned the dreadful war. When morning dawned, the board was spread with cresses, nuts, and berries red, and Garavog left her heather bed. Black Ray McCrew and Glassy Shield set up the bream, the bray, and eel at midday for her ample meal. Twelve haunches of the fattest elk, twelve measures of the richest milk, twelve breasts of eagles from the height composed the meal for eve or night. Titanic Garavoke held her sway, the feast at night, the chase by day. Her pack just numbered three score ten, no fleeter ever crossed a glen. Red spido with her broad full chest and his oak round ribbed, and the best. Determined now her tomb to build, her ample skirt with stones she filled, and dropped a heap on Conmore, then stepped one thousand yards to law, and dropped another good and then with one prodigious leap gained Conbeg and on its height displayed the wonders of her might. And when approached death's awful doom, her chair was placed within the womb of hills whose tops with heather bloom. You know, given her idea of an ample meal, one might think she could have done with going to wait watchers. Lepping around on mountain tops with an apron full of stones after a meal, the like of that really wasn't a very good idea. One can see why, already rather overweight perhaps, after some pretty powerful eating, with an apron full of stones added to it and given the, the forward momentum of that giant leap, that she just sailed right over the mountain and down the other side. The figure of a hag is, of course, a common one in European mythology. In Slavic folklore, for example, Baba Yaga was a hag who lived in the woods in a house on chicken legs, and an old woman of some type became an almost stock character, you might say, in fairy stories or folk tales. And the term crone was often used to describe them. The clear case of ageism, if you ask me. Oh, yes. One of the customs in Ireland associated with the Hariak, seen as an old woman or hag, referred to the first day of May. The Irish festival of Beltane, or May Day as it came to be called, and that involved protecting your home, and especially your herd of dairy cows, since the Haliak would steal butter, milk, cheese, and even cows, oh yes, even cows, sneaking out at dawn on the morning of May Day to practice her nefarious activities. To thwart her, one had to decorate the cows with flowers associated with the primroses, marigolds, and, and, and buttercups, to sprinkle them with water from a holy well, which, since there are over 3,000 holy wells in Ireland, wasn't a particularly hard thing to do, and get the animals out of the fields and pastures and into a barn, the barn itself slowly decorated and suitably sprinkled with the holy well water, and do it early in the morning. Now she could still be seen as an old wizened hag, but not in an evil or mischievous way, simply as a, as a woman on whom age has taken its toll. As in the famous medieval Irish poem, The Lament of the Hag of Bear, in which she reflects on the passing of her youth. Clearly in this poem she does not see the ageing process as her golden years, but a very long way. <laughs> no, not at all. This is part of it in the translation from 1919 by Lady Augusta Gregory. I am the hag of bear. I never knew smock I used to wear. Today such is my mean estate. I wear not even a cast-off smock. The maidens rejoice when May Day comes to them. For me sorrow is meet. I am wretched. I am an old Amen, woe is me.
every acorn has to drop after feasting by shining candles to be in the gloom of a prayer i had my day with kings drinking mead and wine today i drink wayward among shriveled old hags yes well Halliak wasn't always seen you know as a, as a wizened sort of dried up prune faced being seriously in need of a facelift and a walking stick no no not at all her mountain leopard activities are ample proof of that in fact since she was said to either drop or actually throw stones from her apron as she traversed the land mountains and rocky formations springing up in her wake her name became associated with geological sites across the country more so than any other celtic deity linked to mountains high rocky places craggy outcrops and the like high up places a decrepit old crone would be somewhat unlikely to ever be able to get up to at all such as the, the hag's head on the cliffs of Mar, passage tombs around the Dartry mountains and caramore and Sligo, one of them known as the house of the Hyliac, which were produced by her dropping stones from her apron that she had acquired from Loch Crew. A tomb atop Sleeve Gullion in County Armagh is known as the Hyliac Vale's house. If anything, rather than being a wizened old hag, many of the versions of her athletic prowess seem to indicate she could have won gold at the Olympics. Certainly the high jump would have been nothing at all compared with leaping across mountains with an apron full of pebbles. And remember, remember that each of these pebbles, as they are called, was actually a massive boulder weighing many tons. Oh, yes. Oh, yes, you see, her pebbles were not your average little common or garden pebbles, nor those you might pick up at the seaside. Oh, no, not a bit of it. You couldn't create mountains with that sort of pebble. Come to think of it. She might have done rather well in the weightlifting event. Now, there is no definitive version of the Hellgate legend. It varies from place to place, and not just in Ireland, no. She pops up all over in Scotland and in the Isle of Man as well, presumably having taken a running jump across the Irish Sea. Ah, there you are now, there you are now. The long jump and the pole vault Olympic gold without it. She is most closely associated, I suppose, with the counties of Kerry and Cork and with Sligo, and seen as bringing winter with her. Indeed, her ability to control the weather and the seasons resulted in her being regarded with an equal mix of reverential awe and fear. In her guise as changer of the seasons, the bringer of winter, she was not someone you really wanted to annoy. In some tales, she seems little more than an Irish version of the Wicked Witch from the Wizard of Oz, while in others she has almost, almost the status of a god. Certainly she could be seen as a demigod. The Veiled One, as she was sometimes called, could be seen as a, a creator deity, shaping the landscape, though whether she did so intentionally, throwing her boulder pebbles in some versions or accidentally dropping them the pebbles simply falling out of her apron because it was really rather too full is, is somewhat unclear since she is mentioned as doing it both ways she carried a hammer using it to control storms and thunder and also to to shape the landscape in her intentional creative moments and in some tales she also presided over a well that if she fell asleep would overflow and flood the land creating lakes and now her appearance could alter drastically oh yes young and beautiful at times if she chose to be turning the heads of men she might fancy old and haggard with pale skin a blind eye and red teeth at other times and on the isle of man she was said to transform into a giant bird so she can be seen as a shapeshifter now the versatility of this woman is amazing but she has a, a unique place among the deities of the Celtic peoples, a people spread across France, Spain, and the British Isles, as well as Ireland, of course, in that she is only found in those regions that spoke variations of Gaelic, Ireland, Scotland, and the Isle of Man. Now, hags and witches, of course, they could be found right across the Celtic land, of course, and some similarities to the Hagia can be found elsewhere outside of Celtic regions, at Thor's Hammond yonder, for example, though his use of it, of course, was completely different or the Norse goddess Skadi, though she was only associated with snow and winter. She didn't have any control over it, as did Bhagavad And in the Slavic tales, of course, Baba Yaga could be kind and helpful or decidedly unpleasant. 
helping someone one day and being a right old bag the next and spoiling the whole day. And her heart could bounce so long on its chicken legs when she too would go off rambling between mountains, but she never lugged boulder-sized pebbles around to create anything. Despite the occasional similarities, the unique characteristics of the Haliak are found only in the Gaelic-speaking regions. She was neither good nor bad as such. Her actions and her intentions for those actions, like her appearance, varied depending on the tale being told. She could be a violent, destructive, natural force with her storms or floods, yet also she would care lovingly for animals during the winter months. In contrast to her cattle rustling activities, of course, on Beltane, seen in all of the three regions as helping wolves made aggressive by winter hunger, for example, said to be a, a deer herder in Scotland, clearing the snow so the animals could obtain food. And she was very partial, apparently, to black cats and to other small animals which she would care for. Now, she had a very close relationship with the great goddess Bridget. They were rivals, you might say, insofar as they shared control of the year between them, she ruling the land during winter from Samhain on the 1st of November to Beltane on the 1st of May, and Bridget ruling the summer months in between. There was a, a friendly rivalry, of course, they each had a job to do, so they didn't actually come to blows over it. On Imbolc, the 1st of February, the Haliak was said in some tales to run out of firewood for the rest of the winter and she would go forth in her guise as the old woman to collect more. Now, if she wishes for winter to last longer, she makes the day sunny and bright for her search, enabling her to gather plenty of firewood to warm herself in the coming months, and winter will continue for longer, unless she falls asleep. Ah, then the day is inclement. Grey and stormy, she will have no firewood to prolong the winter, and therefore it will be shot, for which all gape. It is said that this tradition was the inspiration for Groundhog Day in the United States. She is mentioned as being married to various persons, including a trickster old man named Bodach, and even Manan and Maclear, the Lord of the Sea. And as the old poem puts it, she had fifty foster children in there. She had seven periods of youth, one after another, so that every man who had lived with her came to die of old age and her grandsons and great-grandsons were tribes and races. You know, it must have been a nightmare remembering all the birthdays. And how fortunate for her they didn't celebrate Christmas. Can you imagine the expense of presents for all that lot? Female figures, female figures were very important to the Celtic peoples of Ireland, you see, and, and Scotland, such as Danu, the mother goddess of Ireland, she who created the earliest Irish being known as the Tuatha de Dan, and a mythological race of gods and goddesses, their name meaning the tribe of the goddess Dan. Bridget, great goddess of hearth and home, often seen in triple form. The Morrigan, goddess of war and battle, and like Bridget, seen as a triple entity. Macha, defender of women and children. Eru, her alternate name, Erin, given to Ireland, being the name of this country in Irish, and, and many more. Now, the image of the Haliak may have been the inspiration for a very seditious song written during the Irish Revolutionary Period of 1798 called the Shen Van Vocht, which was a phonetic rendering of an Irish phrase meaning the poor old woman. And it became associated later with the Home Rule Movement in the 1890s, Ireland itself seen as the poor old woman. Very poetic, of course. Now, William Butler Yeats used the same image in 1902 in his play Catherine the Hulhorn, where Ireland is represented to begin with in the form of an old woman, the image of the Shan Van Vocht, a play set in a cottage near Kilala Bay in County Mayo in 1798. An old woman comes in telling of how she suffered over the years, tells of how young men have died in battle for her and the like, trying to get the men to rise up in rebellion against the occupiers. News comes that the French are landing in Kalala Bay, that men are going to join them, and the old woman leaves to greet them, followed by one of the young men in the house, despite the efforts of his family to stop him. When another person comes in and is asked if they saw an old woman going down the road, they, they answer that they did not, but they saw a beautiful young woman. A beautiful young woman, and she with the walk of a queen. The Shandan Vox had become... Kathleen Hulahorn. 
And so we leave us all yet. Veiled old hag with a missing eye, or beautiful young woman. Decrepit octogenarian hobbling around on a stick, or fantastic athlete leaping across mountains, destroying things with raging storms, or petting little bunny rabbits. Take a choice. She could be all of those things, her image changing to suit the eye of the beholder, you might say. But in whatever guise you chose to see her, the Chaliak remains a, a great figure from the mythology of ancient Ireland, easily taking her place beside Daniel the Morrigan and Bridget. A figure to be both respected and feared, to be admired and even loved, depending on what she happened to be doing at the time. A bit, a bit like Ireland itself, that mixture of comedy and tragedy, of happiness and misery, so many opposites and emotional mixtures down through the ages, with a bit of blarney, of course, and, and quaintness uh, thrown in for good measure, all blended into a unique Irishness, unlike anything that you'll find anywhere else. Slod.